welcome along to NUFC Matters with me, Steve Wraith, and Malcolm McDonald. Good evening, Malcolm. Hi, yes, Steve. Good evening to you. How are you yeah, doing? Yeah. I have to say, you're, you're looking well, um, although unshaven. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, that's it. The beard's, the beard is back, Mal. The beard's back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, look, it's it's been difficult. I think it's been difficult for everybody. Um, oh, it has. We're starting now. I think you're starting to fall into the routine. I, I know I am. I'm, you know, obviously, I'm keeping myself busy by doing these these broadcasts for people about Newcastle. And the fact that we've all managed to grasp different technology has has meant that we can now speak to each other, which is great. But I think um, just exercise and 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 you know, I'm still you know, I'm still being homeschooled by the kids. Uh, and still managing to catch up on a bit of television I never thought I would see. So, um, so yeah, it's I think, and then you add your meal times to that mal. It's you know your day's gone, isn't it? So we're starting. Yeah, to yeah. It's, it's amazing how how they do flash by. Yeah, are you coping all right? Are you, are you managing to get out for a walk in that mal? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. I take the dog out regularly, um, uh, although he's not the greatest of walkers. Um, it has to be said, he, he had op leg operations uh, about uh, three years ago, so that, that slowed him down. But uh, nevertheless, well, what we did was we, we, we bought a doggy pram and we put him in the doggy pram and, you know, because now and again he has really bad days. Yeah. And, uh, and so we put him in the doggy pram and he loves it, absolutely loves it. And he sort of looks down at other dogs from on high. Um, and, uh, and almost as if he's royalty. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I think he is because he has uh, has me and the wife chasing around after him all the while. Uh, good stuff. Well, obviously yeah. the world might have come to an end almost, but Newcastle United is never far from the news. And of course, the takeover is is continuing to rumble on. Um, are you concerned, Malcolm, that we haven't had you know the end game of this, or, or do you think that it's you know predominantly down to the fact that the pandemic is is obviously the main you know the main focus of the Premier League and trying to get football restarted I'm not concerned in the slightest to be honest uh, the, the matter is now with the Premier League and, and and neither side can move one step forward at all um, and the Premier League they've got much bigger things on their mind at the moment they they've got a um, uh, hundred and more fixtures that they need to get completed um, and, and end the season um, with, so that we know who's going into Europe, we know who the champions are and who's relegated. Um, you know, and then one, once we know things like that, then football can, can get into order. And the Premier League, they can then pay a bit of attention to Newcastle. But at the moment, they've got far, far more important and pressing matters um, to, to get sorted. And I think that everybody can sit back um, and await the decision from the Premier League. And I cannot see them declining um, this situation because there have been too many precedents that are almost identical. You know, so once the decision is made over a particular situation, they've got to stay consistent. And I think that that's uh, what will happen. And in time, uh, the Premier League will come down with a decision that it's OK. Also, it's not a bad thing because there has been a bit of furore going on uh, um, surrounding the deal. That uh, There's a lot of people saying that it shouldn't be happening and what have you. Um, but the, it gives the Premier League time to allow the whole thing to quieten down and, uh, and sort of come to a, a, a natural end. And then they can make their decision. Then the takeover can happen and, uh, and all the business get carried out. I have, I have no doubts um, whatsoever that it will now go through. And you know how pessimistic I was over and over and over again as, as each little bit of news came out and, and other things were happening and, uh, and I kept saying, no, it won't happen, it won't happen. But this deal is totally different to everything that's gone before um, and, and I think this is a very serious 
business deal which will happen. I think it's been, you know, delayed essentially because of the pandemic. I think that a lot yes. of the, I think a lot of the issues that we've we've seen and a lot of people saying, well, you know, the Man City deal only took 23 days and people pointing to the Charlton deal and, and, and you know, other, other clubs that have been taken over. Well, that happened very quickly and this happened over six weeks. But, you know, the, the, you know, the world hadn't stopped. And I think I keep pointing to the, the fact that I work quite heavily with the Boxing Board of Control, Marlon. And, you know, the Boxing Board is closed. There is nobody at head office in Cardiff. So I, I would presume that the FA is exactly the same. And, you know, when you're dealing with a takeover of this proportion with one of the biggest clubs in, in, in the UK, um, you know, I personally feel that, you know, a lot of things which would normally get done face to face around a boardroom table at the, at the Premier League won't be happening like that, obviously. So, you know, mm. we're led to believe the documentation for the takeover alone is something like 350 pages long. Now, if, you, if you're imagining in, this, in, in the world that we're living in now, you and I would normally be doing a talk in at the Dog and Parrot, for example. Um, we're having to do it online. Well, of course, the meetings that the Premier League will be having to do you know, their meetings online. So Absolutely, imagine, yes. imagine if there's a bit of paper or a few documents that you have to look at, and there's more than Richard mm -hmm. Masters needs to look at this, of course, you know, then that has to be circulated to people and people need time to, to digest it. To of look course, at the organisation is absolutely massive on each and every item. And it's not just um, the Newcastle takeover that uh, they're having to oversee and make decisions on. There's all sorts of other stuff going on. Um, and so I think we've all just got to be patient. Um, and as I say, I'm pretty sure that the whole thing will go through in time, but it needs that time. Yeah, I think as well, you know, I think the other thing that people need to realise is that this is, this is quite complex. This isn't one person taking over a club. This is, this is three, three big groups who are all involved. And I would imagine when you're looking at the fit and proper persons test, for example, that not only would the Saudis need to be looked at, but Amanda Stavely and her husband would need to be looked at, and the Rubens would need to be looked at. So again, I'm unsure on what, what you know, what the what the actual you know test criteria, yeah, and criteria involves. But you would imagine that every single person who is named as a director, for example, would need to be looked at. Right. Well, how long do you think um, it would take an accountant to go through uh, the um, the accounts that it, that all of them are putting forward. You know, everything is so complicated, incredibly complicated, um, and it would need probably expert eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it, it's not as if they can get together in one building and say, right, you do this, you do that, and you know, and, and, and get the whole, all the different tasks sorted out. And it is a complicated matter, very complicated. But in time, I know that the Premier League will get there. And they, I'm pretty sure, because as time goes on, football is getting poorer by the day. Well, we all are, because nothing's happening. But football in particular is getting poorer because they have got massive, massive wage bills and rely on the money that's coming in. Well, they've still got the wage bills to pay, but they haven't got any money coming in. And in fact, the people who usually, the companies that usually supply the money, they're maybe looking for a lot back. And so football, it, it, it's going to be a lot poorer um, come uh, later this year. And, and so I think that the football authorities will say, hey, look, here is... A, a, a brand new influx of hundreds of millions of pounds. And that's what they will bring, particularly in the transfer market and, and, and what have you. And so it will get the circulation of funds going in the game. And, uh, and you know, and you know that, you know, that a, club, a, a club does one deal, it sells a player, so then it goes and buys one. And then that club that sold it will go and buy another one. And it, and, and it's a, a, a knock-on effect um, that helps the game to, to stay above the surface and, and thrive. Yeah, 100%, Mal. Obviously, with a takeover not going through, we have the issue of contracts 
Um, and obviously, we have a situation where we have a few, a few players who are, are coming to the end of their contracts and who may have to sign short-term deals. Um, we also had the, the, you know, the loans of Bentelab, um, Lazaro and Rose, um, who can all play on you know, through July and beyond the original recall date, I think, now. Um, but you've also, you know, you've also got the situation with Andy Carroll, um, with Matty Longstaff, uh, Rob Elliott. Uh, Javier Manquillo. Um, now the question is with them: Are they willing to sign short-term contracts, or you know, are they unwilling to risk their future employment on short-term deals? I mean, what, you know, it's, it's a hell of a situation to be in. But again, it's unprecedented with with yes. COVID, isn't it? It is um, absolutely unprecedented. What I I think the football authorities could well have created. Um, the solution to, to this problem. And if they had said um, the season is being extended and therefore all contracts are extended by the same period, that would have, that would have kept those whose contracts are ending on June the 30th. June the 30th would have just shifted um, perhaps into um, uh, to the... 31st of July or, or, or the middle of August or whatever, but it would have seen the, the, um, the season through for all clubs and they would have had the same squads of players. But what is going to happen is that there's going to be a lot of players um, whose contracts are due to end on, on June the 30th and they've maybe got situations already um, commenced and, and maybe agreed even, um, say, with a German club. Because the Germans have started much, much earlier and therefore their season is going to finish way in advance of, of the season here in this country. Um, and, and they're going to be ready to play next season earlier than, than, the, um, than the English League. And, and so it needed the football authorities in this country, I think, to say, right, the season's being extended by six weeks. We are extending all contracts that end on June the 30th by six weeks. And that would have resolved all the problems. Some of the players might not have liked it, but they have a duty to, to, the, to the club that has been paying them for the past few years. And, and, and when something so, such upheaval as this has been um, for, for football and football clubs, the players, have, they've got to play ball. You know, and, and I do feel that a lot of, a lot of footballers, that, you know, they, uh, they're not going to give up a penny. They want to be paid in full. And, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about the club not earning whatsoever, you know. And and the attitude of footballers, if if they don't come to reasonable terms in all of this, that they could be pushing football itself um, to the very brink of destruction. And so footballers, I think it's important that that that, that they get into the whole swing of hey, come on, what do we do that best? to make the game survive. Yeah, 100%, Mal. I think it's um, a Premier League meeting today as well. I think and they're, they're talking today about a couple of outstanding issues, one of which, of course, is, is the squads, you know, the, uh, the squad lists which were, which were you know, published at the end of the January transfer window. Clubs had to submit you know, the players that they were going to finish the season with. I think that the Premier League are obviously going to have to look at amending those in the coming weeks as well because obviously some players will leave and some players you know, won't want to commit to... And, and, that... and, yeah, and, and um, a couple of clubs may be losing two or three players, but there are other clubs who are maybe losing 10, 11, 12 players out of their squad. You know, so, they've, so they're limited to a squad of 25. And so if they've got 10 or 12 players uh, departing because their contracts have come to an end, dear me, they're, they're down to 13 or 14 players. Yeah. And, and 
and that seriously weakened the whole situation. You know, I, I, I think the players have got to be reasonable in, in, in this situation. Um, uh, and, you know, what the one thing you don't do is bite the hand that feeds you. And it's football that feeds footballers. Um, and so footballers have got to have um, the respect to, to make sure that that hand stays very healthy. The Matty Longstaff uh, you know, situation is dragging on, obviously, again, because we're all sat at home doing nothing. It's easy, it's easy money for the journalists to, to come up with a new spin on that. Be nothing at all from Longstaff's side. The club, of course, hasn't spoken at all since you know, the, the season came to an abrupt end in March. Um, the rumours have it that Mike Ashley's essentially left the building, put the keys of the club through the door, and he's washed his hands of club affairs, and that the only thing that's actually operational at the club at the minute is the first team. So it was a surprise to me to see the announcement in the Daily Mail with Craig Hope's story about you know, Dan Barlazer agreeing a, a contract extension to remain at St James's Park. The obviously 23-year-old um, made, made an appearance in the League Cup, I think, for Newcastle in, in August uh, 2017 against Notts Forest. Uh, had a good loan spell, of course, at Crew Alexander. Um, so he started to make a bit of a name for himself, and the rumours have it that he's a different player to the, the one that Rafa gave the opportunity to. But, you know, I, I find it strange that they've come to an agreement with Dan, but there is nothing being said, nothing announced, and nothing forthcoming about Matty Longstaff. It's, it's a strange one, Malcolm, isn't it? Yeah, very strange indeed. Um, whether, whether or not... Uh, they don't rate him, um, then if that's the case, why did they put him into the first team and, and stick with him a lot of the way? Um, and I felt that he was, he was doing pretty well. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a huge task. A young player in, in his very first season, you know, usually they can exhaust themselves after five or six games and they need to have a rest. Um, and, Matty Longstaff, I felt, was he was just coming back um, into the whole situation um, when, when finally he just disappeared off the face of the first team. And, uh, and, and all I can think is that there are talks, there are talks that have broken down. And, so, and, and, the, and it, it certainly appears to me that the club are appearing to be making a decision on him in the terms of that we, we're we not interested in you. Um, certainly not at the kind of money you're asking for. I, I'm not sure on that, but I, I'll just give that as a possible reason. Um, maybe, they maybe they don't really fancy him. Maybe what they've seen is, it, it isn't satisfactory um, in, in the games that he's played so far. I'd be surprised. You know, I've, I've heard one or two whispers that the, that, the, that, the, that the club don't feel that he's a premiership um, player. Uh, well, I'm, I think I tend to disagree. Um, one of the things I felt that he was suffering from um, was, was having John Joe Shelby in midfield. John Joe Shelby can be a very, very selfish player. He looks after himself in what is a team game. You know, and sometimes you've got to make your, your game more expansive than that. Um, and, uh, yeah, with, uh, with Matty Longstaff, I, I know that clubs are interested in him. Most of them are abroad. There are one or two in this country. Um, they're premiership clubs. And, uh, and, and if it is a, um, that, he, that he must leave, then I, I seriously wish him all the very best of luck. He's a lovely, lovely lad. Well, they're, they're a lovely um, pair of brothers, um, Matty and, and Sean, and, uh, and they come from a, a super family. I see them quite often, you know, um, because uh, the two lads, they, they come along to North Shields Football Club, um, where, of which I'm president, and I go to a, a, most of the home games whenever it doesn't clash with Newcastle United. So, uh, um, so I go along there, and quite often 
um, the two brothers will stroll into the ground and uh, 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 um, uh, and I always say, I hope you've paid <laughs> because we're short of money at North Shields. But, um, and, and it's lovely to have a chat with them. They are just super guys um, and absolutely dedicated to wanting to get on in the game of football. Um, and that, that, that good, clean living um, lads. And I, I just find it difficult to think that somebody at Newcastle United has made a decision, Matty Longstaff's not good enough, after what we've seen of him just starting his Premier League career this, this last season, well, this current season. Um, and at the same time, who is it who's actually making a decision on him? Is it the person who decided that they should buy John, Joe Linton? Because if it is, <laughs> I wouldn't trust that man um, with with any son of mine, that's for sure. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point to make. Just just finally on on Longstaff. Um, I know that you know when you were at Newcastle during during your break, you you went across and played abroad. Um, you know to keep your keep your training up, and you weren't yeah. sitting around Mal. What you know? What advice would you give to to Matty Longstaff if he does make the move? Do you think it's do you think at the age that he's at, it's a good thing to be doing? I mean. 30 grand a week in the grand scheme of things doesn't sound a lot of money for going to play abroad, but he would become Udinese's, you know, top, top paid player. Um, but, you know, is it something you would advise any young footballer to do, go abroad and, and try it? It's, it's always good experience, but I think that... Um, mine, and we're, we're seeing... Um, uh, we, we, we're seeing two or three instances of, of young lads who have left this country and they've gone to Spain, they've gone to Germany, and they are really doing well. There's a lad at Barcelona, there's uh, uh, um, certainly a couple of lads in Germany, all doing well. So Udinese, oh, Italy, can, that can be a bit difficult, just the, the mindset of how they play the game. It hasn't changed an awful lot from the 60s and 70s, although they, it's a little more attacking, but, uh, but nevertheless, um, they're very defence-minded there in Italy. Um, but it's all extremely good experience. The, 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 the biggest problem is having to learn the language. You know, you, you need to be able to communicate at all times. Um, and uh, and Ital Italian is not the easiest of language. I've, I've had personal experience of that myself. Um, but I, I understand that the owners of Udinese also own Watford and one or two other clubs around the world. Now, I understand that, uh, that Udinese could set the deal up do it and then the second stage of the deal would be for him to move on to Watford. Mm. Now, um, what, what truth there is in that, I don't really know, but uh, it's an interesting theory. You know, and this is when, when owners are owners of multiple clubs, then they, yes, they can sort of maneuver from one club to another, you know, and, 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 and make deals a little smoother to happen. Um, so, you know, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if, if come later in the year or next year, we see Matty in a Watford shirt playing against Newcastle. Yeah, sad but true. You mentioned Joe Linton there, or rather the person who made the decision to bring him to Newcastle. He's, uh, he's been back in the press uh, over the last few days talking about the, uh, the first season at Newcastle United and you know, his, his season in the, in the shirt. Clearly doesn't seem to feel the pressure. And you know, certainly, uh, you, know, you and I discussed this before we came on air. You know, it, it, it almost seemed to be a rehash of what he'd said before that, you know, that he doesn't see goals as an important part of of his game. Um, did that surprise you? You know that the man wearing you know your old shirt, the number nine, would would say that goals weren't as important to him. 
if I were the manager of Newcastle United and um, a forward said that in public, I would haul him in front of me and say, out, out of the club. Don't want you here. You, because that kind of mindset is so totally wrong, Steve. Um, you, it, it, you need to have a, pos, a positivity running through the club. And a centre forward who says, I'm not bothered about scoring goals. And he's got one in what, 20, 27, 28 matches? It's absolutely ridiculous. And... And people should be taking action on that, not allowing him to get away with it. It, it. He's explaining to us what his mindset is and what's actually lacking in it. He's got no desire. He's got no passion. He's he's got no uh, um, he's got no self pride. You know, could, could you imagine Alan Shearer? having come from Blackburn in a world record deal and say, oh, I'm not concerned about scoring goals. <laughs> Dear me, the whole of the whole of Tyneside would have had a massive heart attack. It, 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 and, and, and yet, because we've seen him for these 27 games that he's played in, and, and, and we've seen that he doesn't care. I don't think he cares about really playing the game and certainly doesn't care about scoring goals, he might be the nicest fella uh, um, in the world. But he is not a centre forward. He's not a goal scorer. He's come under false pretenses. And who the hell got Newcastle United to pay that vast amount of money? He should be out the door. Absolutely out the door. Because... I, I, what I'm frightened of is what that person does next. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It's uh, it's a scary thought, and uh, one would hope that a takeover would would you know put an end to to those kind of deals for those kind of players. But let's let's wait and see. We'll come to Joe Linton a little bit later in the show when we start talking about the the, the forthcoming fixtures. I'm not sure if you're aware today, but the 11th of June, Malcolm. Um, uh, well, this this week is obviously the, the anniversary of a very special man in your life. Uh, born on the 11th of June, 1918, in Edlington, Yorkshire. Do you know who it was? In 1918? Yes. Edlington, Yorkshire. A, a big man at the club. Oh, Joe Harvey. Was Ed, it? No? Ed. Yeah, Joe Harvey. Yeah, that's right. So the 11th of June, 1918, he was yeah. so amazing this week. Um, amazing this week would have been a, another birthday for Joe. Um, well, tell us about, he, tell us about he, the man that he was. Sorry. Oh, he, he, um, he had, he, he, in all honesty, he was a man of little words. Um, but he knew what he wanted and he would get it from people with very, very few words expounded. Um, th there, was, there was a wonderful tale that was told me um, by the lads who were in the 1969 Fairs Cup winning side. And it was down to, uh, and, it, and it was down to Joe to, uh, he had to give the team talk. And he stood up in front of all the players and he reeled off all of the trophies he had won. And he said, I've been at this club as a player, as a coach, and as a manager. He said, and I've never lost a cup final, so don't you bloody start wrecking my record. <laughs> now, what a great team talk. Nothing to do with football, but it, but it just fills you up with a desire to just want to get out there and beat anything that's in front of you. And of course, they, they, they were two remarkable performances, the, um, the two legs. And, uh, and, and, and 
and Newcastle got their first European trophy. But that team talk, for me, it just, it, it, it expressed for me just what Joe was. Man of few words, but by heavens, he could, he could make them hit a point right on the nose. Um, and, and, and he, 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 was, he had that Yorkshireman's blunt honesty about him. Um, and uh, I remember when I first met him, and Alex, Alex Stock, the manager of Luton, um, he arrived back at Kenilworth Road and, he, and I was there. I, he had told me to, to be there. And he said, I've just come back from the Great Northern Hotel where I've spoken with Joe Harvey and, um, and the Newcastle board. He said, and a deal of £185,000 has been agreed. He said, now get down there. He said, have a talk with them and sting them for every penny you can get. What I was unaware of, and this is what Joe's first words were when I... I, 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 got, I got there and I had asked where the Newcastle United party was and they said, oh, go down that corridor and they're in the lounge at the end. And I was going down the corridor and all of a sudden the door um, at the end of the corridor just filled with these great big shoulders. Um, and, and Joe Harvey came through the doorway and walked down and I sort of held my hand out to shake his and uh, said, um, I said, I'm Malcolm McDonald. Alex Stock has uh, told me to come and see you, Mr. Harvey. Um, and he, he said, so you're the little sod who's just cost my club £30,000 more. It turned out that Alex Stock had made, um, had, had agreed a deal at Easter with Newcastle for 155 But I happened to score a hat-trick in my last game for Newcastle. And that was just three days before I sat with um, Joe Harvey. And, and, and Joe Harvey, he, he finished off that sentence um, uh, by, sa by saying, what do you think you were doing scoring a hat-trick in your last bloody game? You know, so he gave, me, he, he gave me a right telling off for scoring a hat-trick for somebody else. He never told me off for sc scoring a hat-trick in, uh, in Newcastle colours, that's for sure. You know, but... <laughs> But that was Joe. He, he, he was just blunt and honest right from the start. And then he relaxed and we had a, and we just got on absolutely famously. Um, and he had that ability to, to be like a, a father figure to all the players and not pushing himself in any way. Uh, um, but you always felt that that you had a fatherly pal uh, there at the end of the dressing room. And uh, um, it, as long as you all behaved, as long as you gave everything, things were fine with Joe, but don't cross him. Tell, tell us about that story um, when he had a game of golf with, uh, with Terry Hibbert. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear. Um, Joe came into the dressing room one, one morning when we were all getting changed for training and Terry wasn't there and Joe, he looked around and you could tell by his face that he was, he was in a controvert, in, 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 a, in a bit of a, um, in a bit of a mood, you know, um, and and, and he looked around, Terry wasn't there, and, uh, and, he's, and he's started muttering under his breath, breath uh, the little bandit's not here, where's that little bandit? And, and we all sort of said, uh, Joe, what are you muttering about? He said, that little bandit, Hibbit, where is he? And we said, well, he, I think he's getting a bit of treatment or something. He said, little bandit, we said, what do you mean he's a little bandit? He said, I played a game of golf with him yesterday for the first time ever. He said, and you know, I play off six, said Joe. He said, and, uh, and that little bandit told me that he played off 16. He said, uh, so 
not only did he beat me, he said, all seven stone of him out drove me off every bloody tee. <laughs> he said, outrageous. He said, seven stone he is, soaking wet at that. Um, and he was absolutely livid. That, and he was a big hitter, was Joe. And he said, you know I'm a big hitter. Well, that... And of course, with Terry, um, it, it wasn't strength, it wasn't power or anything like that. He, when Terry and a ball got together, his timing was immaculate. And it was just timing. And, and yeah, he, what he did with a golf club, he could do with his left foot. You know, and uh, yeah, Joe, bless him. And, but he, he got out and played Terry again. You know, but he... Typical York, my father was a Yorkshireman, and uh, um, and so I grew up getting used to blunt speaking. You, you know, the, when they had something to say, they said it first, never in the middle or last. It was all that was the first thing that they had to say. So, so, um, we've had having known my father so well and and got used to that way of speaking and living um i i appreciated joe for his absolute honesty at all times and and i always think if you're an honest man you deserve honesty back in return and and i i always sensed that players were giving that honesty back if they didn't they soon moved on all of a sudden there'd, there'd be a deal sorted for them and away they went well, he's an absolute legend at the club. Um, hopefully, with new owners, they'll see fit to either building them a statue or, or even renaming a stand after him. Because I think uh, somebody like Joe Harvey, who was you know uh, an integral part of the, the FA Cup winning team in the 50s, 51, 52, 55, captain in the team, and then obviously taking uh, you know taking the immense pride in leading Newcastle into Europe to win their first European Cup, and then. You know, taking Newcastle back to Wembley again yeah. in the seventies. Yeah, and the last trophy, Steve. Yeah. It's now fifty-one years since Newcastle have won a trophy. And um, it's a shambles. It's a shambles that we yeah. haven't won anything since then. Yeah. But I think I think equally equally. And Joe, he, he should he should really have um, have a statue the size of Bobby Robson's. And in a prominent place like Bobby Robson's. It's, it's absolutely crazy. And I remember the, the battle that we had. You know, I was involved with uh, the Fairs Club trying to get the plaque agreed. We eventually got the plaque agreed with the club under Mike Ashley's tenure, it has to be said. And, you know, they, they basically expected us to raise the money for it. So I managed to raise, yeah. I, I remember I managed to raise £5,000 with Danny Cox. Um, by doing an event called the Mackham Slayers at the Lancastrian Suite. The Fairs Club raised the other 5,000. So it cost us 10,000 to put that plaque at the Gallagher end, which... At the arse end of the um, ground. It's ridiculous. You know, it's right on the corner, around the court. And the, it? And, the, and the club didn't want me, the club didn't want me there to, to be a part of, the, part of the unveiling, you know, and this is... Yeah. The, Thing that you're dealing with with Mike Ashley. I've covered that in my book, Mal, which uh, once it arrives on the 1st of July, you will get a copy and you will get a chance to read it. So uh, that's Very in the book. Um, one, one other birthday today. What, what have you called it, Steve? It's called Every Boy's Dream, Malcolm, because as you know, I did sign it. Yeah. I did manage to sign a contract for Newcastle, not as a player, which, uh, which was a good thing for the team, but obviously as the fans liaison officer. So that was, that was my dream, to sign a contract for the club. So uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it, Mal. I'll, I'll make sure you get a free copy. All right, I look forward to that. <laughs> one of the one of the birthday today. This person's still alive, and that's John McNamee. So I, I'm sure you'll join us in wishing him all the, all the best. Happy birthday to John. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, very happy birthday, John. My word. Um, he uh, I, he was the, the stories about John McNamee were were absolute legend. They really were. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if people are aware of how he came to sign for Newcastle, but um, his greatest ambition was to play for Celtic. 
um, but he was playing for Hibs, and he would and he dreamt of getting a move from Hibs to Celtic. And 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 this is what I was told when I first uh, um, arrived at Newcastle, and and I think it was Joe that told me the story. And John McNamee, uh, for the umpteenth time, play, and this was playing against Celtic, was sent off for a, for a foul. And he was walking off, and Jock Steen popped his head out the dugout and said, Hard luck, big man. And John suddenly turned around and swung his boot, and he took a lump of concrete out the roof of the dugout. You know, and Jock Steen pulled back. Um, and and the and the Scottish authorities, the footballing authorities, they were going to ban him, sign die, and that's when Joe moved in. You know, he's a shrewd operator. He moved in because John was on the verge of being totally valueless to Hibbs, and Hibbs said, "Look, if we get him out in the country and go and play somewhere else, can we sort of just drop it?" And they said, "Yeah, okay." So Hibbs did the deal with Newcastle and that's how he came to be at Newcastle. It was very shrewd on the part of, um, of, of, of Joe Harvey. Um, and the first time I played against Leeds, and it was at, uh, at St. James Park. And Leeds had a reputation being rough and tough at the back that they, that they gave a lot better than they ever got. And uh, John McNamee trotted forward for a, for a corner. And I actually saw fear in the faces of the Leeds United players as he came into the penalty area. And he just said, follow me in, son, to me. I said, oh, OK. And Johnny just started a run. And as the corner was coming on its way, he sort of aeroplaned himself and jumped, jumped through the air in this aeroplane fashion. And, and he just literally piled up all the Leeds players from the six-yard box into the back of the net. <laughs> well, um, and, uh, well, I've never seen anything quite like it. And they were absolutely petrified of it, the Leeds players. And probably every every right because he was he was hard as nails was John, um, and and yeah he, he was he was a lovely fella, really lovely fella, and uh, yeah happy birthday to him because I know that he's had he's he's been having quite a few problems of late, yeah. So uh, I really do wish him well, along with happy birthday wishes. Yeah. Um, well, Malcolm, next week we're going to be able to talk about football and not the takeover, hopefully. Um, hopefully, yeah. we'll, yeah. the takeover will be a step closer, but we'll, we'll be able to talk about results and teams and, and what have you. But let's, let's just look back at, at what's gone before. Um, if, you were going to give, if you were going to give a school report on Steve Bruce's performance and his team's performance uh, so far, what would, what would you say? On Steve Bruce's report, I would, I would say we had little hope of this lad getting on and making anything of himself. And he's proved me wrong. He's much against the odds. Uh, he's got all of his team performing well. Uh, and and has and has uh, how to put this? It, it, he's he's got there with the team without really impressing. Yeah, I'm not impressed, but I've got to say, hey, well done, Steve. Now you, I, I think you've done terrific with what's. Um, with what you've got to work with, you have done absolutely terrific. And, and so, um, there's not a lot else that, that impresses me about him from what I've seen. 
Um, you know, his demeanour on the on the sidelines. Um, it's I, I I never get the, the impression that he's in control, in command, knows what he's doing. You know, I um, I always sort of feel a question mark running through my head as, as I watch. Um, but the team have, have, I think they've played beyond themselves at times. So I've got to give the credit to Steve. Uh, well done him. Now, um, and of the team itself, um, the, we know the defence has its certain frailties, but you've got to say well done for all the goals they've scored. It's been quite phenomenal. Um, and in midfield, it's been great to see uh, the two brothers coming through as they have done. Um, the long starts. I, I just, I, I, I really think that having to play with John Joe Shelby is nigh on impossible for them. He, he doesn't help them, doesn't assist them, um, and at times doesn't offer himself as, as a, a um, as a ball out of trouble, and so uh, I think you know John Joe, he's got a lot of ability, but he plays for himself. But he will decide what kind of game he will play. Will he go and play between the two centre halves? Will he go and play in? up and, and in support of centre forwards. One day he'll play it one way, the next game he's, he's doing something else. There's a lack of consistency and when you put youngsters in the side, what they need is consistency around them. Um, when I was managing Fulham, I, 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 put, I, I was quite willing to put kids into the first team. And what I discovered was um, that they would play about five games and they would literally look like that. You could see that all the energy was just sucked out of them, that they had exhausted themselves. Um, and that in the end, after the five or six games, their mind just wasn't working. And so I used to take them out and say, I'm not dropping you, I'm, but I'm just leaving you out because I want you to replenish yourselves. And, and I said, and if you want to go and play in the reserves, you can. If you don't, you don't have to. But they always said, yes, I want, yeah, I want to play. I want to play. And so they get in the reserves. And, wanna, and the phenomenal thing that I witnessed was that with all of them, just going and playing in the reserves, that's the moment they, they changed from boys to men. And after three or four games in the reserves, I'd bring them back into the first team, play them, and they were a different class. They were a different stature, different demeanour. They were, uh, in, instead of the young lad um, on the wing, they suddenly had this stature about them they were taking responsibility. They were, they were shouting to older players in the side and giving them instruction. And it was, it was absolutely wonderful to watch. Um, and, and so that rest did them the, the power of good. Um, and uh, I, and I, I, I see... You know, similar situations. There are times when you just need to pull players out. I think Joe Linton should have been pulled out a long time back. I think now, I think he's got utter brain exhaustion. He would probably disagree, but I don't think that he can think clearly when he's on a football field about what needs to be done. You know, that he, he just can't make a decision to save his life. And so... When you're without decision, you slow up and things stop be being natural. You have to think about them. You, you become laboured. 
and that's how Joan Linton looks to me. Um, and and you know, and it's you, you have to be cruel at times to be kind. And I think somebody should have been cruel to Joe Linton, taken him out, work with him. And I just wonder who who who's working with him. You know, when you think that that living locally, um, there's Alan Shearer, there's there's myself, um, and and two or three others probably, who who know and understand what scoring goals is about. Not just the fact of scoring goals, but knowing the pressure that you can be under and uh, and, and so on and so forth. You know what's required. You know what's needed to to enable you to go and do your job to the very best of your ability. And I don't think he's being shown that. And in the end, he comes out um, with, this, with this statement that he's not bothered about scoring goals. And that, that's the end. And, and they've, they've allowed him to almost kill himself off in the game, I think. You yeah, know, and it's a shame. Strange one. So obviously the games are going to start uh, next week. Project restart is underway. Uh, Newcastle have to wait a little bit longer before they face Sheffield United at home. Um, first of all, Malcolm, I mean, how do you think the team is going to cope without the backing of a full St James's Park? Now, if of all of the clubs in the Premier Division, probably Newcastle, Manchester United and Liverpool will, will miss the crowds most of all. Because the atmosphere that is created in those three stadia um, is quite phenomenal. You don't quite get that, uh, that, uh, uh, that feeling um, at the Emirates, you know, it's it's a sort of uh, very modern affair and, um, and and set out more. It's uh, um, it, it's a it's a whole different ethos at Arsenal um, as to Man United, Newcastle United, you know, Northern clubs and all that. You know that uh, it's looking after the fans. Um, so. I, I, I am concerned, I have to say, that an empty stadium, um, it's, it, it could seriously affect players. Because I think that, I think that, the, that the players um, during this season um, uh, to, to, to the end of play, they've actually risen above themselves because there's been this great atmosphere. Even when they've been getting tanned two and three nil, the crowd are still there and still with them. You know, I've not heard a solitary boo in that ground um, for, for for a couple of seasons, um, and 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 that's and that really is looking at G the players up. They should be brimful of confidence, but a lot of it comes from the terraces, and uh, so. I just have the feeling that Newcastle, they could suffer um, by the current situation. Uh, albeit, um, they, they have to get out um, and, and look to play. And Sheffield United is not an easy start. Definitely. So this fella, he is getting the best out of, out of his, of his um, first team squad. Um, I think that their performance has been absolutely remarkable. And if I were asked to, to vote for the, for the team of the season, I would say Sheffield United. I think they've been absolutely brilliant. And I've watched them three or four times, albeit on the box. And by heavens, they make it difficult to play against. And, and they keep flooding forward. Their, their fitness level is phenomenal. And so it's going to be a very difficult start for Newcastle. We've, we've played two games behind closed doors, Malcolm, uh, since I spoke to you last week. We've played Newcastle's uh, two 
you know, the squad played each other. So it was Newcastle versus Newcastle, which finished 1 1. A's versus B's, eh? Ben Deleb scored and uh, Joe Linton scored. And then, of course, on Tuesday, we played Middlesbrough um, at home. And Newcastle found themselves 2 0 down with uh, Saville and Asombalonga scoring the goals. But uh, rallied and came back to win 3 2 with Muto, Almiron, and Joe Linton getting the winner in the 90th minute. So I know it's two games, two meaningless games, two blow the cobwebs games out, but Joe Linton has scored in both games. So maybe playing without a crowd might suit them better. Uh, quite possibly, actually. Um, and, and also, uh, maybe by saying, Goals don't worry me that they've started to come his way. <laughs> it's a good habit it's to get into, man. It's a good habit to get into, It's a good habit to get into, as you know, scoring goals. And if you can do oh, it, yeah. that would be great. We'll finish off, Malcolm. Obviously, just last question, because we'll, we'll look at the Sheffield United game when we do this next week. But, um, yeah, 10 games on the, you know, from the 21st of June to the 26th of July. It's going to be a bit like Christmas, isn't it? It's going to be very intense. Yes, uh, it certainly is, and, and incredibly tiring. And it, it's, it's like starting the season, but under, under immense pressure, because you've got all the pressures of, of the end of the season on you, which you never have usually um, in August when you start. Uh, it's going to be very strange, very strange indeed. It's going to take the players out of their norm and players are creatures of habit all footballers are creatures of habit they'd like to do it in the same way well it can't be done now and uh, and it has to be done by a different set of rules um but i think that if they they've just got to concentrate knuckle down get on with it um and and sometimes you know, you can create a sort of crowd noise, a buzz in your head if you really need it. Um, and maybe they'll put it on the loudspeakers. Who knows? Why not? You know, I, th I know that they've been talking about it. Um, so, yeah, why not put some crowd noise that's been recorded? And I'm sure there's plenty of that. Uh, so, um, I wish the players well, because also what you have to remember is that they've had a longer break um, with this coronavirus. They've had a longer break in the middle of the season than they normally get in the summer. And they haven't had um, the freedom and the facilities to, um, to, to keep themselves fit by doing the, the training program that they need. And also... Football is, is very much a team sport, but it can be played by individuals. You know, you've got to have your individual strengths and you've got to have your team strengths and what have you. Um, and <clears throat> players on their own can hone their individual strengths. But the team strengths have died. And so they've got to get those um, built up very, very quickly. Um, at, at, in such a short space of time um, and, and, and with those strengths of course comes understanding you know it's almost like you can just read their minds you know what they're doing you know what they're going to do you know what's coming next um, and, and that's probably what they'll have lost and they've got to regain it as quickly as possible it's not going to be easy at all it really isn't um, and well, and none of us have ever known anything like this before. And so it's, uh, it's going to be a tough old job for all footballers to get themselves playing again. A really tough job. Well, Malcolm, the clock's beating us. Uh, great to chat with you again. And uh, I'm looking forward to next week uh, getting you on uh, next Thursday and uh, chatting about the, uh, the game ahead. So... Uh, have a good week. Stay safe, you and Carol, and uh, enjoy your walks with the dog. And uh, we'll catch <laughs> you next week. 
All right. And uh, hope your family and, well, everybody who's, who's watching, I hope all of your families are staying safe and uh, 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 are making the most of this uh, break. And uh, hopefully our freedom will be granted at some point in the near future. That would be nice. Good stuff, Malcolm. Thanks very much. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Take care. Good night. Thank you.